Um, <coughs> any questions before we start? For the in the weekend, I also I made sure that I uploaded some sample questions on uh, chapter four. So uh, do start working on those sample questions. Okay. All right. So now we've already seen some um, lower level design aspect of uh, computer architecture, and now we're gonna come up to the point that we wanna handle the memory hierarchy, right? In that classical uh, five components of a computer, and now we are at the point that we are trying to understand how we're gonna play with the hierarchy of memory to exploit and run the programs faster with different techniques. So within this paradigm, there is a notion called cache, right? And that, uh, that, that's a bulk of the, the talk in chapter five. So first of all, let's talk about the principle that is called a principle of locality. So we have two different subcategories for this principle. Um, in general, when you run programs, they, they need to access some small portion of right, um, their address space at any time. Right? In order to access that faster, uh, we need to use cache in different levels. So there are two sub-problems within this principle of locality. First of all, is the first one is temporal locality. Items accessed recently, they are more likely to get access again, right? So you're in a loop, and some instructions in the loop, you think that, uh, or the, the computer or the compiler might think that you've already accessed them 200 times, chances are a lot you're gonna access them again. The other one is spatial locality. So the items near each other are prone to have, to get access more. So there's a term for that, they, uh, they're called contiguous part in memory. And in GPU programming also, it, it's a very important, uh, let's say, it's an open problem. So when, when you run parallel programming, when you try to optimize your code, having them uh, having to exploit contiguous memory and the way you define your code uh, matters a lot when you run them in multiple threads and in parallel. In uh, say you're running it in, in a thousand core, and a program needs to iterate over many things. So define them in a way that you have uh, exploited the the cache or memory hierarchy of that system that you're running on will impact the code by a large, large margin. Okay, so let's have a quick example of these two principles, temporal and spatial. So say you have two nested loops, right? You wanna iterate over i and j for a number of times, and then you increase that iterator by one. And then <clears throat> at each step, you wanna update your ai by multiplying it by j, okay? So can anyone mention what are the temporal and the spatial um, references are? So by temporal, we were talking about the items that are accessed, right, already are likely going to get access again. Okay, so that's a temporal one. And for a spatial one, are the items that are accessed are likely to get access nearby, so the contiguous spaces, okay? So you want to update this AI. So simply you can understand that I am iterating over a number of times by I and J, right? So I'm accessing the space that was allocated to A in memory a lot of times, okay? So simply you can refer to the references that are done with A, and also you're accessing I so many times, and also J, right? So simply you can say A of I and I and J are gonna get access a lot of times here. So the references to these three are gonna get considered as uh, a temporal locality. Also, when you iterate over I, you are going up and down. So this is like I plus three, I don't know, I plus six. So after you access I plus three, you're gonna access because you're going plus plus here in this direction. So you're gonna access I plus four, right? Previously you were accessing I plus two. So you can consider as spatial locality. Sorry. Okay. 
you can consider the, the references to AI as spatial as well. Okay. So for those who arrived right now, we were talking about two principles of locality in memory. Okay. We are talking about memory hierarchy and cache systems. There are two principles, one temp temporal locality and the other one is spatial. By temporal, we mean the items that are accessed recently are going to get access, are likely to going to get access again soon, right? For instance, items in a loop or instructions in a loop. And for a spatial, there is another uh, notion that calls the items next to each other in an array, for instance, uh, or the term that we use is contiguous, are likely to get access soon, right? So using these two principles and having these two codes, we mentioned that we can refer to the references to AI, J and I, as temporal because we are accessing them many times, right? And for a spatial, also we can consider AI because at one iteration we were accessing A1 and then A2, right? A3. So it, if this was A, A of I, so these items are going to get access, right? These are the contiguous items next to AI. So this is considered a spatial locality. So for these two, uh, we need to take advantage of these two principles. How are we going to do that in a computer system? By uh, exploiting memory locality. By the way we define the variables and we want to exploit cache systems, right? So, in general, we call a memory hierarchy because it represents a hierarchical system, right? So this is your CPU on top and on the bottom you're going to have your hard drive disk. Just so this is your CPU and this is your disk. So you start from the highest level of cache and then you're going to get bigger and bigger up to the point that you have your memory and then bigger than that you're going to have your hard drive disk or flash drive depending on the type of the drive you have. So you see it's, it, it is representing a hierarchical system. The closer you are to the CPU, your processor, those memory elements or the cache uh, sizes are normally smaller. That's why in your computer when you take a look at your L1 cache, L1 is a smaller then L2, and L2 is smaller than L3, and then L3 is smaller than your memory, memory is a, normally is smaller than your hard drive, and so on and so forth, right? But the, the more they get bigger in size, they are smaller in the speed, right? So there's a trade-off. You want to have higher space, you want to have a bigger space, you're going to pay the price for being it, uh, to, for, to having to access it as a slower sort of system, right? So the way we trade off these two is defining the way we exploit the locality of the memory hierarchy. Okay? So cache memories are type of SRAM and the normal memory you've been uh, knowing previously is called DRAM, right? So let's have another example for that. So this is your processor on top. Normally we want to access <coughs> block by block or by block we refer to line by line. So this is the unit for copying things when you want to access it in processor. Okay. If the access data was present in an upper level, so let's think about it as cache here. L1 cache, the first level of your cache. And this is your L2 cache, for instance. Or think about it as L2 as, as memory, right, or disk. So, you see this is a smaller cache, a smaller si chunk of size available to you next to your CPU, closer to your CPU. Because the bigger they get, they get further and further, and then the transfer time is going to get higher. And also the other point that you have to pay the price for that is the 
penalty that you have to pay every time you miss predicting or or missing something when you are looking for that specific block in your cache. So I mentioned that <clears throat> when we want to access things, right, we access it by block or uh, lines. So usually we transfer an entire block, then we copy between the uh, the levels, right? If the access data was present in the, in the upper level, for instance, if we were looking for this block in blue and it was present, so we call it, it was hit. So it was a hit. Everything is good. We can access it. We're going to retrieve it back up. If we were, for instance, accessing this, something that was not available in the, the upper level, it is called a miss, right? We were trying to access something and we couldn't find it, so it's a miss. So. For this miss, when it happens, we need to look for that specific chunk of block or line in the lower level of cache. So on the second hierarchy, we go on, on a bigger size, either L2 or could be memory or could be L3, right? And then we find it here, and then we transfer it back to the upper level, and then we access it to the processor. But anytime we have a miss, right? So say this was a miss here. We have to pay a price because we were looking for something we couldn't find it. Now we have to find it from the lower level, right? So for this miss paradigm, we need to pay a penalty. It is called a miss penalty. That's why anytime you have a hit, everything is good. You just the the, the price you have to pay is just the the, the transfer of the hit. <clears throat> but every time you miss, you have to pay the miss penalty plus the price that you transferred it from the lower level to the upper level, and then you access it. Okay, that's the hierarchy that memory works. And using the amount of time that we found and hit and the amount of time and we couldn't find and miss, we can define miss ratios and hit ratio. So simply hit ratio is the number of hits per accesses. We were accessing it 200 times. 100 times of those we found it, so we hit. So it's like 50% of the time we had hit. Our hit ratio was 50%, right? Just like that, one minus hit ratio is going to be miss ratio. So if you lose, if you hit 50% of the time, that means that you've lost or you have missed 50% of the other time, like it's the rest of the time. So that's that's going to be your miss ratio, the number of misses divided by accesses. Okay. And I mentioned that we're going to have we're going to have to pay a penalty when we miss when it's coming down. So there's a penalty. And we define miss penalty as a time to replace a block in the upper level with the corresponding block from the lower level. Okay, plus the time to deliver this uh, deliver this block to the higher level. <clears throat> All right. All good so far. Okay. So we were talking about this hierarchy. Let's see a table of some rough numbers. That's your cache on average, right? And the results, so these, these numbers are for 2012, so like some years ago. So normally you see that the access time of cache, which is the closest and highest in the speed next to your processor, is pretty much very, very smaller, right? the average time is around one to two nano, nanoseconds, okay? However, the price of making a sort of a SRAM uh, sem semiconductor that, that is being used in caches, memory caches, uh, is very, very higher, right? On the other side, you go a little bit down in that hierarchy, so that's your classical memory, your RAM, so the speed of the RAM is normally around within 50, 50 ish na nanoseconds, and the price drops a lot from that uh, higher price of SRAM. You go down again, you go to the flash memories, some newer hard drives and flash disks. You see the access time is getting increased a lot with respect to the other tools. And then finally, your old type of magnet disk 
those that you you could hear when you op when you power on your computer and it was rotating, right? Older computers or most of the PCs they ha they still have that. There's a disc that is rotating. Uh, those are magnet discs. They are pretty cheaper, so you, you might just buy I don't know 10 terabytes of that, less than 100 bucks. But you see that the speed of the access time is going to be way 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 lower than the the one that caches at. But the point is, L1 cache might be like, I don't know, not even a megabyte. L2 cache might be around that, or L3 might be higher. But with this, you're gonna have 10 terabytes, right? So there's a trade-off you have to pay. In ideal case, it would be nice to have something that of an access time of SRAM, but of the cap uh, capacity of a disk, which is not happening. But we need to find a trade-off when we write codes to exploit those, okay? All right, so <clears throat> normally in your DRAM, your normal RAM you've been using, so data are stored in banks, right? So you want to access some data, you want to access the bank of data, and then you fetch rows of those, and then you, you retrieve it back either for read or write, okay? So modern um, DRAMs, I guess we are at, DDR4, in, in a few months DDR5 will be out, perhaps LE 2020. So I guess your reference book is normally referring to DRAM by DDR3. So in DDR3 technology, they are organized in banks, right? You see all these banks here. Um, typically four for DDR3. And each bank you see consists of some rows. You want to access those rows for write and read. Okay. So a row address is sent with an act <coughs> or activate. So this is standing for activate. Um, so when you send this act, it's going to cause the bank to transfer one row to the buffer, okay? So that's going to be your buffer here. When a row is in the buffer, it can be trans transferred by successive column accesses, right? Using the address, and typically it's going to be four in, in order of 4, 8, 12, and 16, right, in DDR3. And you're going you're gonna to be able to access it by read and write. So this is the way it works normally, okay? Any questions so far? So what's the difference between DDR3 and DDR4? So their technology intrinsically are different and their speed is, is higher. So DDR4 is higher. I'm not sure about DDR5 that hasn't been out yet, but the speed of DDR5 is, is even better than, higher than DDR4. So does DDR4 use banks as well? Or does it use as some of them, and some of them are not. So it depends on the... Uh, because it, it depends how they, they, ha they have been implemented by different companies and they have their own proprietary, you know, design perhaps, right? Okay, so these are some slides for your information. So it just talks about the bits and how, how they're going to be organized in, in DDR RAM. So they are in rectangular array and <clears throat> Some of them are supporting double data rate and quad data rate, okay? So it depend, again, depends on the model. You can refer to your uh, reference book for more information on this. So there's a general trend that you can see from 1980s up to 20, uh, 2007, right? So the capacity of 1980, the, a, a normal you know, a market capacity that you could find with this amount of money, so dollar per gigabyte. So this is like count the zeros here. I mean, there was no gigabyte back then, but if, if you were to have it uh, sorted out by, by the price, it would, it would have cost a million per gigabyte. 
right? But now you see one gigabyte of RAM in 12 years ago cost only 50 bucks, okay? And at the same time that the technology using uh, Moore's law is increasing, your access time that we define with T of RAC, which is a random access time, and T of CAC, which is the column or page access time, have been decreased a lot, right? It's starting from the 250-ish up to around pretty close to zero now, right? So the definition of um, random access time is, is, the, is the time required to read any random single memory cell, right? So that's your, suppose that's your memory. There is like one gigabyte. And the average time to access one random single cell and find it and read it, right? Normally, they're going to consider the worst case scenario. They're going to call it T random access, right? Okay. For T column or page access is a time required to get the data at the output, right? That's why this one is a little bit higher than because up to the point that you transfer it on the bus and then to the output, you're going to have to spend more time. That's why there is a small difference here, right, between these two lines. Okay? All right. Again, let's have another introductory slide. So, 1980, you saw that the total access time for the new column was around 250 nanoseconds. But now it's going to be around 35 nanoseconds. So that's the amount of a speed up we have gained in 30 years, right? So divide this 250 to 30, 35, and you see around eight or nine times the speed of RAM has increased. At the same time, the access time has decreased a lot. Your average cost per gigabyte has been decreased. A million times at least and you see we were in order of kilobytes in the 80s and then now we are in order of 16 32 and 64 gigabytes now okay all right so the performance factor you can roughly think of how we're gonna access those how, and that's why it's a random access memory because it needs to find random data fast. So the way we um, we design the banks and we access them either synchronously or async, right? Or the way we buffer those rows that determines the the uh, the performance factor of a DRAM. Okay. So in that table we were talking about flash disks. And magnet disk. So let's just have two quick slides on those. So for flash storage, some of the newer hard drives in laptops uh, or your just flash memories are using non-volatile semiconductor. So instead of a uh, instead of a disk, a magnet disk, normally they use a NAND gate, right? They are smaller, lower power, and more robust, right? But their price is between, they're uh, cheaper than DRAM, but they are more expensive than a normal disk, right? A magnet disk. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that they can be of NAND type or NOR flash. And normally after some thousands of iteration of use, those bits that are holding the data for those NAND gates or NOR gates are going to get worn out, so that's why they're not very reliable. They're not. Uh, that's why it's better after some thousands of accesses, you make sure you, you, you back up your data. Okay. This is the good old magnet disks in your older um, laptops or PCs, right? There was a disk that was rotating, right? And there was a magnet that was reading those by each rotation. It could find just like your uh, gramophone, right? 
it would find the data. So it has cylinders, sectors of data, and tracks. And that's why uh, it was recommended when it was rotating, you do not just you know shake your uh, PC or laptop that much because it would have just made those sectors a bad sector. Okay. All right, these are just information for you. An access, average access time of a disk could be considered as an example here. So you have this amount of sectors. This is the speed of the disk that is rotating, right? 1,500,000. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 15,000 RPM, so rate per minute. That's the, the rate that is rotating. And assuming that the average seek time is 4 milliseconds, and the transfer rate is 100 megabytes. So what's going to be the, the overhead? So you just have to, this is an average number, right? So you divide this by 60, which was per minute. And this is an average number. So that's rotational latency. That's one, one thing. So it's, if it's going to, um, if it's able to just spin faster, so this would have been decreased a little bit. <clears throat> Your transfer data has its own transfer time. You have to controller overhead delay and that's your seek time to first find what sector of the data you need to look at so you add them all together and you're going to have around six milliseconds for, the, for that is a specific example and in average if the average seek time instead of four was one so you the average read time is going to be three so you're going to see that it's ar around a ratio of one to three okay adding all the over, uh, other uh, overloads the transfer rate the, the controller overhead, okay, so it's around one to three for the magnet disk. All right, so um, more information you can have a look at it. So it's based on the manufacturers. You're gonna find it on, on top of the the HDD. If you have a look at it, you're gonna see the RPM. You're gonna see the access time and other information. They are supporting different um, transfer, input and output, right? So let's start talking about cache memory, okay? So the one that is closest to the CPU, right? Normally it starts from L1 and then L2 and in newer systems L3 or you might have just L1 and L2, right? They're just getting bigger and bigger, and they get slower. Okay, and this is your CPU. So say you have some accesses, you need to reference some addresses and values of those addresses. Okay. First of all, how do we know if the data was present? So first of all, we need to find x of n in this case, right? So at before before the access. We were trying to find xn, right? This is our cache. We were trying to find xn, okay? Then this is after we access xn, so it is in cache. That's, that means that we were looking for xn. We searched this. We couldn't find it. It was a miss. We found it from the lower level, either from L2 or L L3 or from memory. Then we copied it here. Now we access it, okay, after this one was referenced, okay? So before and after. So now we have two questions. How do we know if the data is present, first of all, when we are searching for x of n? And secondly, where do we look at it, okay? We're in cache, we have to look at it. Are we just looking at it exhaustively? Or there are ways to um, identify where to look at it faster? Depending on the way we map the data in cache, we have two, three, or even four different categories of caches, okay? The first one which we talk about tonight is gonna to call a direct map cache, okay? And it's the simplest one to implement. So suppose this is your memory, this is your RAM, okay? And you have only one level of cache, and this is your cache only cache. If that cache contains <clears throat> um, the technology of the cache was 
direct map cache so that means that all these memory references are directly mapped so you, are, you have only one choice only by one choice you can access one block address in a number of blocks in cache which we call this modulo okay so take a look at these memory addresses here Normally in a direct map cache, we have to have, in memory, we have to have a power of two of the size of the cache. So the size of the cache is eight now. See, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. So this is two trays of eight, okay? Or when we have this size, this size is log two of that value, okay? So, we mentioned that this is a cache structure in which each memory location is mapped to exactly one location in the cache, thus an 8-block cache uses the three lowest bits, okay? So, using the three lowest bit of these addresses in memory is going to find us the specific location or the direct map to find the values in the cache. So, here we have my three lowest bits are 0, 0, 1, okay? 0, 0, 1 tells me to go for block number 1, which is this in gray, okay? The last three, okay? Now, looking at the last three of these is 101. 101 represents what? What number in my cache block? Any guesses? One one. Five. Yep. But we are starting from uh, zero, so this is the sixth time. Six. Okay. So that's why. Look these colors, so the gray one can be found here, right? The blue one can be found here. And then after two, that's one map of the first eight. So these first eight are these here, okay? Again, from this, we're gonna restart and come from here. Another eight, another eight, another eight, another eight, okay? That's why these three last digits, zero, zero, 001, are exactly mapped to exact zero, zero, 001 place of the cache. And that's why we call it a direct map cache. By just looking at the last three digits, the lowest digits, right? Least significant bits, you want to find the cache block right away. That's why all these blue are mapped here. All these grays are mapped here. Okay, you understand why? Is it clear? So, if I wanted to access this, which was 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, which line or which block of the cache I should have looked, I should have looked. Why last one? Yeah. So just looking at this 111, this represents the last digit of my block of 8, okay? So if I wanted to access some addresses here, I needed to look at this block of the RAM, uh, this block of the cache, okay? So this is, a, this is a, the, the simplest cache technology, which is called a direct map cache, okay? Now, you see that using those uh, list, list three significant bits, we can directly map the addresses of the memory to the cache. However, every eight of those, in this case because we had eight, every eight of those are on top of each other, right? So we have to find another way to distinguish between the groups of those eights, right, to access. 
in order to find those groups, we need to use the other two remaining bits of the address. And we call the other two tag. Okay? So we can define by the first two as tag and the rest of the tree as the, the block number of the cache. Say if, if you had these five, this would determine the block number, like, right? The block number of the direct, direct map cache, and this would define the tag for us. And simply by these two, we could have found the specific location and tag of the data that, that we want to access. And also, there's another thing. <clears throat> there's this valid bit that when we access, it's going to be 1 if it's present, right? If it's not present, it's going to be 0. And initially, when you start executing program or when you start your computer, it's going to be 0, OK? So using this that I just explained, So that was tag. We can have some variety of examples here. All right. So say we just start up the computer, right? Or we flush the, the memory and cache. Everything is like blank in a, um, hypothetic, a, a hypothetical scenario, right? So we have eight blocks, one board per block, and direct map cache. That's the initial state, OK? Now, I'd like to have a, to access from my memory, this is my memory, my cache, OK? I'd like to access this. How am I going to find if it was a miss or hit? I just have to look at the, the, the least significant three digits. It is defining the block number of my cache. So 110 is going to be defining 7 here, right? Starting from 0. Then the validity was where all n and now is y is valid now after I access this. I looked at it. Previously, there was nothing, right? So I did not fetch any data out of that. That's why I had a miss, right? So I was trying to look at the, the value of this address. It was, it was a miss. Then because of that, I need to go down in memory. Say I have one level of cache. And that was my, so before, so in my memory hierarchy, I had one cache. And here it was memory, OK? Now, in order to find the data of that, I need to go back down in memory from cache, pay the price for the miss penalty, bring the, the, the data of that, the memory of that address that I was looking for, OK? Back to cache. <clears throat> and then it's going to be the first one that I'm accessing, OK? This is a cache miss. That's why it's a cache miss. The next one. Can anyone explain why I have another miss here? So I'm looking for, this is my binary address. This is my word address, right? Okay. okay, so I have eight. How am I going to find which of those directly mapped block I should access? And let me know if it's a hit or miss. And why is that? So, one 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 zero one ten. Okay, let's talk about it here. So we already accessed this. This was here. So one one zero one ten. I'm trying to. This is my binary address. I like to have the va data on. Okay, that's my instruction. So one one zero one ten. How am I gonna find which of those blocks of my directly mapped cache? And how am I going to find if it was a hit or miss?
Anyone? No one? That was the valid bit, okay? Initially, it's going to be 0. When it's present, it's going to be 1. If it's not present, it's going to be 0. So n or y, none or yes, right? Or 0, 1. Okay. It's, no, it, that, that means that the data is present there, yeah. Some data is present. Before, it was all none, right? because nothing is presented yet. And then after you had a miss on the previous iteration at this location, so some data is transferred from memory, so memory of this address, right? That's why we show it memory 101110, uh, 110. That's why it's gonna turn, set this to Y, okay? Now, on the next iteration, so we've already accessed this, it was a miss, it was here. Now, the next one we wanna access is 11, Zero one zero. Here you go. Huh. How are we gonna find what uh, what uh, what block of cache we're gonna access this? So I mentioned that when we have when we have these five, right? We had to look at the last three digits, least significant digits. Yeah. So it's in the third one. The third one. Why the third one? Because the last three Yeah. So you just have to look at the last three digits, which is what? Zero one zero. Okay. Zero one zero in in binary represents what? Three. So you start from zero. It's going to be three now, right? The first one is zero zero zero, zero one zero, and then zero ten. It's exactly the same. Just look at the exact identical. That's why it's, it's a direct map, right? Now, you found which block of cache to look for, okay? So that's the first step. You found this is a block. Do I have a miss or hit? Why? There's no data. It was none, right? It was zero. There was no data, and you could not find the data of the address you were looking for. So you need to come down to memory. This is in cache. You need to come down to memory and do a mem of this address you're looking for, which is 11010, okay? And bring back the results up to here, pay the penalty. Then you want to set this to Y. And you understand that I mentioned that the, we use the first two as the tag number, 11, okay? So the next one is going to be this. There's another miss, so that was miss. That was a cache block we were accessing. We set this from 0 to 1, so it's available now, and the data has been brought from memory to the cache, okay? Is it clear now? Okay. So next one. If I want to access um, so this is gone the next one would be 11 0 I'm sorry okay um, how about this why is it? So which block I should look at using this five binary? Yeah, the last three is, is pointing to to seven. We start from zero, so it's gonna be this one. Right? There was some data already here brought before from memory, so that was the, the data that, that the block was available. That's why it was Y. So we were trying to access the this data. So it's there. So it's a hit, right? 
We don't have to pay a price. We just fetch it right away. That's why we have hit. Another access would be hit. Okay. So that's the easiest and simplest. Yeah. What is it? Because we were trying to access the data corresponding to this memory address, and this data was already there. So we were looking for the uh, the value, right? Say that that cache block was referring to a number four. Okay. We were referring to a to an address of that cache block. You were looking to find that number four. Okay. It was already brought up before from memory, so we could access it right away. That was a hit. If we were looking there and there was nothing. We had to bring it again from memory to the high level, which was the cache, and that was a miss, okay? So you either have a miss or a hit. All right, so the next one. Here, you were trying to find the data inside the, the, the index of 0, 0, 0, right? Previously, it was empty. Nothing was there. That's why you had to come down to memory, fetch the data, bring it back up to fill this block, right? And then set this from n to y, 0 to 1, and that was a miss again, okay? So for the direct map cache, <clears throat> depending on the size of the, the cache and the addressing, because these two should match, in this case, we use the last three as the block of the cache, and we use these two as tag, right? These are tag. Here again, the final one, you have 100110. Previously, this one was was there, the value was there. However, your tag was not there. The tag was a different tag. Okay? You were looking for 10. Don't look at this. The next one is this. 10, <coughs> 0, 10. Okay? So this shows the block of cache I have to look at. The block represents this, okay? 0, 1, 10, okay? I have something here. However, I have something here, but the tag doesn't match. This is not the data I'm looking for. All those data are there, but the tag doesn't match that this is not the data I was looking for. So it still is going to be a miss. So on the next iteration, this will be a miss, and this will update, will be updated by the, the right tag number and the right data. Okay, so it's going to get to 10, and the data that I was looking for. The reason why we had this issue is, you recall here, this is your memory, right? This is your cache. It should be a smaller than your memory. Right? So every eight of those are going to get directly mapped to eight of this. Okay? So because of that, every eight will have the same address. Okay? That's why you use a tag number for that 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And that's the first two digits. Okay? So this is the tag. Everyone got the idea of the tag? Because we are using the same direct map addressing, we need to distinguish every instances of eight, in this case, by a tag number, which are the first two digits. So in, this, in the last example, although the previously was 11, right? But we're trying to access one with a tag of 10, so that was not the right data we were looking for. So still, we had a miss. And then we update the tag with the one we asked. Okay? All right. Any questions? Yep. So if you were looking for the, the one that had the tag of 10, like, would that be in a, like a different date block? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So after 
we update that? And if I have to come back to look for tag 11 again, so it, does, does it have to, like, does it become a mess again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It has to come back again to memory, find that the specific bit the tag of uh, 11 now, and then change, the, change the, the, the data of this. Because this will be different for a tag of 10, right? Good question. Yeah. Any questions? All right. So let's carry on the discussion on Wednesday. Okay. See you in the lab. Oops.